This is going to be very different from many of the talks yesterday because I'm fundamentally an image analysis type of person and I wanted to talk to you about the problems I see with trying to extract meaningful information and then knowledge out of the enormously rich information and data estate we see with Digital Earth. And because I'm an image processing person, I'll have to talk about it that way. But the problem that intrigues me is that when we take together this collection of information, some of which is spatial, some of which is non-spatial, much of which is socially generated through uh, social networks, how can we make decisions that help us manage the problems that uh, interest us? And particularly, how can we get machines to help us make decisions? Because the rapid dynamic of the data that we see before us, the amount of data coming in, I think means that we're not going to be able to handle it all ourselves, that we're going to need machine assistance in uh, what we do. Because I'm an image analysis person, I unashamedly come to digital earth from a remote sensing perspective. And so I wanted to set the stage for what I'm going to talk about by just tracing this very simple development from remote sensing, which started you know, in the 1960s and 1970s, and many in this room would have gotten their introduction to this field through, come through remote sensing. And then, of course, as we moved into the, the late 70s and 80s, we realised that uh, remote sensing data wasn't the only game in town, that there were other things that we could mix together with uh, satellite and aircraft image data that we formed into what we generically call a geographic information system that uh, we then put in the hands of the resource manager for decision making. And then as we moved into the 90s, we get the sensor web technique or concept where uh, all of those uh, space-borne sensors and ground-based sensors and existing maps and data from other sources get combined together into uh, what I've called here a sensor network, but we generically now call a sensor web. But the really interesting development, of course, was when um, in the late 1990s, middle to late 1990s, we recognised that if you could bring in cultural and social data, and if you could get the citizens of the world through this amazingly flexible telecommunications network we now have in, in, in place in our social networks, then all of that gives us a much richer estate of data with which to work. And uh, to me, that's the sort of scenario I want to use, because in working up to how we analyse the data in digital earth, I want to think about how we did it in remote sensing and what the implications are in GIS, and that helps me understand the problem. And the real problem to me, folks, is how can you make machine-assisted decisions with data that includes as part of it uh, social network information, tweets, Facebook information, Flickr data, and so on. When we first had remote sensing images provided to us, the, um, the first way we tried to analyse them was as on the left-hand side of the slide, by what we call photo interpretation, using the skills that were developed with aerial photography during the war years, where people could look at the data and understand what the colours meant. But then our colleagues, largely in the signal processing field in the United States, worked out that you could actually apply machine learning techniques or signal processing techniques to the data and do what we call on the right-hand side of that slide classification or thematic mapping, where we could create maps. We could get machines to help us understand how to create maps out of the data provided by the satellites. And, and that's been probably most of my life, and for many people in this room, most of what we tend to do. But in order to try and capture that in a way that helps me sneak up on this problem of digital earth, I thought it would be good to think about what I've called a decision support spectrum that has total human interpretation at one end and complete machine interpretation at the other end, what in the previous slide I called photo interpretation and classification, and ask ourselves a question about where we are along that spectrum at this point in time. Are we more towards the right-hand end or more towards the left-hand end? Both techniques are good. People are much better at making decisions about spatial things and spatial reasoning than machines are at this stage. But machines are much better than we are at being accurate in, in counting things and labelling things. So both have their places. And there's been this trend from the left-hand end to the right-hand end over time. But if I had to guess, 
I would say that most remote sensing analysis now or application tends to be more towards a machine assisted end. Sometimes we use machine work to um, create new data products that we interpret manually, but I'm not going to go into that any further. I just want to get this concept of the decision support spectrum in front of you. Why decision support? Because they're supporting somebody who has a responsibility to make a decision about some particular spot on the Earth's surface. What does it mean for GIS now, just going a bit further? Now, this slide represents a hobby horse of mine from a long time ago. It really worried me in the early days of geographic information systems that um, almost every agency I knew was buying the same set of data to set up a GIS for the same region on the Earth's surface. But fortunately, in about the mid-1980s, we sort of hit this idea, perhaps 1990s, I'm sorry, 1980s, in the mid-1990s, we got this idea that it would be far better to have a GIS that was web-served or web-based so that um, the data users didn't need to hold their own data sources but could purchase them as and when required from the data suppliers on the top line there. And that meant that the problems of um, data maintenance, which I think was a real problem, how do, you keep, how do you keep that Landsat image up to date in your GIS? particularly if there's 100 of you storing the same data, it's far better to leave that in the hands of the satellite agency for you and buy it as you require it. And this also gives us the opportunity for users to develop their own products on a speculative basis and put them back into the database for other people to use. And so, to me, that's the way GIS has developed very sensibly. And, um, and indeed, we did some demonstrations of that back in Australia in the 1990s. Now, what does that mean in terms of this decision support spectrum? Well, first of all, you have to think about how you analyse that data. And this is where the complexity starts. It's quite easy for us to use those classification techniques if you're looking at one source of data. But if you look at a GIS, it's likely to have data types like those listed down the left-hand side of this slide. Now, it's not that we can't analyse them. There are a myriad of techniques that people have applied to analysing that mixed particular data set. But in my mind, it's still not a settled problem. It's quite a complicated area, and any of those techniques that I've listed there, some of which will be familiar to you, um, has strengths and has limitations. The one I think offers most prospect, and perhaps that's because I did some work with a student many years ago, is expert systems. And the expert system is nothing other than having a computer emulate how you and I make decisions. Those of you who are familiar with expert systems, they're just built around rules like if it looks red, then it's probably vegetation, or if it looks blue, it's probably soil. Uh, simple rules like that. But you can build up quite complicated rule sets that help you not only analyse each of those data types on the left-hand side, but combine the analysis as well. And I'll say some more about that later on. So where does that place us on the spectrum? Well, I don't know. I'm sort of guessing in the middle. And the reason I've done that is because the, the geographic information system, system has been more designed as a decision support mechanism. The manager is sitting there with a task in front of him or her, and they have to make a decision. And they extract information from the GIS. Sometimes that information will have some automated interpretation associated with it, but often it won't, and the manager makes a visual decision. The question is, where do we want to be in the framework of the digital Earth? If we think about the complexity of the data that's in front of us, do we want to try and fully automate it, or do we want to happily stay down the left hand end? I don't know. But what I do know, I think, is that the volume of data coming in and the rapidity with which that data is changing means that if we don't try and do something around the machine assisted line, we are not going to be able to get the full value out of the digital earth data framework. And so what I want to talk to you about is how we might do that. And incidentally, this is a very speculative paper. I'm not going to be offering solutions. I'm going to be offering questions, really. But uh, this is the problem I'm, I'm attacking. So how's digital earth different? Well, because of the social data. Because we have social networks available to us now that mean other people can put information into the databases that we have to deal with. And as I said in that slide there, Social networks give citizen users access to data and results, other people's results, in a way that wasn't possible before. They, of course, have a remarkably agile form of communication 
And more than that, they can tell others about their, their speculations and their ideas. I can't remember which one of our two papers it is that I mentioned yesterday morning, the two formative papers. But one actually says, when you go back to the 17th and 18th centuries, many of the important discoveries, particularly in astronomy, were made by people who had no university education. Citizens out there who were driven by a passion and by an interest and could create information that became world-changing information. So there's no reason why there are not gifted amateurs out there who are probably just as good as we experts might be in providing information that will help us refine decisions we have to make about the, um, the what's on the Earth's surface. So any machine-assisted task we come up with has to be able to cope with that. So as I said here, it's all about knowledge flow. Where's the knowledge come from? The knowledge comes from the analysis we do on satellite sensors, and it comes from people. And that knowledge estate is incredibly diverse. What I want to do is break it into two parts. This is sort of sneaking up on the problem by dissection in a sense. How can I um, try and solve this problem by, by sort of breaking it down into components that I perhaps can, can cope with? So I've called them two assertions here. I said, perhaps in the case of, um, of the data we've known about up until the last 10 years or so, we can call it data and use the normal techniques that we know about to help us analyse that data, to turn that data into information. Um, the other assertion is that the, the, the tweets, the messages we get from social networks are not in the form of data. If somebody tweets in information about, I don't know, the, the state of a crop field, they're not going to tweet in numbers like 234, 75 and 23. They're going, to turn in, they're going to put in a message like, that crop field is dying off. So they're going to send in facts, not data. And so I'm, I'm contending here at the moment that if we're going to try and analyse social network uh, messages, we need to treat them as though they are in the form of facts or knowledge already. And that then allows me to do a fairly simple uh, model of how I want to go about this analysis. <coughs> On the top part of that slide there, I've got what might be an analysis chain for spatial data, or, or any physical data, where we get the data, we have to do some form of analysis, which we, I call, turns it into information. The information only becomes useful knowledge once the humans had a chance to, to assimilate and interpret what they're seeing. Those electrical engineers among you will worry about Shannon, and, and I do as well, because Shannon sort of talked about information being the endpoint, but uh, I'm talking about information as being what you get out after analysis, and then the knowledge flows from the person understanding what the implications are. On the bottom side, I'm saying that the citizen input's already in the form of knowledge. What we have to do is to check the integrity and usefulness of that data on the way through. The top line there is essentially the multi-source analysis problem of the geographic information system. The bottom line is the problem I'm looking at. What we want to do ultimately is to fuse both of those so that the knowledge we have about a particular spot on the Earth's surface is uh, benefiting from both of them. So this is my little view, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, citizen-generated data. There might be something about the Earth that's important. We heard at the Perth Symposium last year about all of those tweets that came in about the floods in Brisbane the previous January that people were sending in tweeted information on road closures and levee bank collapses and so on. So all these citizens are observing something and they're sending in that information to someone like us, presumably. And the first thing we have to do, apart from checking integrity, is to see whether the data converges. And that's the real problem to me. How do you know? How can you make some automated decision about whether the data coming in from a number of citizens converges enough so that you get useful facts or useful knowledge from it? And, of course, you have to correct errors. And we heard last year as well, this is a Wikipedia-type phenomenon. We heard last year that if an error is tweeted in, 10 other people will tweet in a correction. And so, socially, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting social dynamic that people will correct others. And Wikipedia entries end up being good entries, at least the scientific ones, because many people are refining and correcting, and that's what we hope will happen here. And I've said at the bottom of that slide there, um, the process could be deterministic. We managers might send out a call for help, tell us something about the um, condition on the top of that hill, and people will tweet back information. 
or could be opportunistic <clears throat> in the sense of Flickr images or so on that uh, we heard something about yesterday and one of my colleagues in computer science at ANU is looking at in terms of analysing YouTube and Flickr data for pulling out facts. The um, thing that surprised me when I started looking at this is how much knowledge there is out there now, not knowledge, how much research there is out there now on social network um, responsiveness and dynamics. Um, there are textbooks out there that talk about when messages go viral, the rules of virality, the rules of stickiness and so on. But there are rules about how social networks work rather than what the outcomes of the messages are. And it's the outcomes of the messages that I think are important. I wanted to reflect back before I go much further on what we're trying to get out of Digital Earth. And um, if you were in Perth last year, you will recognise these as some of the points that have come out of our Digital Earth Vision 2020 statement. On the top in red, it talks about the sort of data that we would like to see in the Digital Earth, uh, what I'd call data repository or framework, and down the bottom, something about how that data could be used or what we expect of the data. I won't go into all of those because we've been through that many times. But in, in, in coming to this analysis problem, it's good to reflect on that, on what the data is that's likely to be in the network and how we want it to behave. And secondly, um, who will use that data and um, who will create and contribute to that data? Uh, on the top there, of course, up until five or ten years ago, we've always thought that the use of the data would be in the hands of the professionals. And we've always thought that the professionals would be the ones that put the data in. That's all changing in the digital earth framework. This open source informality creates enormous challenges of people like me who try to analyse data. So I then thought about, again, how remote sensing started. Now, there's probably not many of you in this room that were around when the first of the Landsat images came in. But um, a colleague of mine gave a wonderful talk in 1979 at the very first conference we held in Australia on remote sensing. It was actually called Landsat 79. And he talked about the gee whiz factor. You know, you look at these images and you've never seen an image of the Earth's surface before. And you're just absolutely astounded that you can see river systems and lineaments and things that are just not possible from, a, from an earthbound perspective or even an aeroplane perspective. Um, so I've said that we often start at that GWS point. And I detect that just a little bit with digital earth at the moment. We are blown away by the potential and we're astounded by how incredible this is. But it can only be a starting point because it really doesn't get us anywhere. You have to start doing something with the data before you uh, can get something meaningful from it. And the normal trend is you, you move towards the qualitative assessment, the human interpretation of the data. Very sensible, and that happened in the case of Landsat. The question is, is it, does it make sense to automate our analysis fully? I suspect not, but I suspect somewhere along that line between manual interpretation and fully in automated interpretation is the right way to go. And that's what I put on that um, decision support spectrum for Digital Earth earlier. We won't quite know where. We'll automate some, we won't automate others. But when we do automate, this is a problem I'm interested in. So let me put up that model of Digital Earth. Now that will horrify many people. Um, people want to get away from this very linear nature of what Digital Earth might look like. But as a data processing person, this is a helpful model for me because it helps me understand the dynamics of data flow. And here we have this, um, what I've called in the middle there, the data repository or the information bus or data bus for Digital Earth. And there are several sorts of data suppliers. There are the professionals and there are the citizens feeding information or data in. And the same people are users. There are data users who are professionals and data users who are citizens. The professionals and citizens alike can create new products that they can put back into the, uh, to the Digital Earth data repository. And that's the data challenge, that's, that's the analysis challenge. How do you cope with that model? Because in some cases, the data is going to be in the form of facts already and not in the form of numerical or statistical values. In other cases, the data will be true data and we can apply the techniques we've used in the past with that remote sensing. And um, sometimes um, in deriving new products, we have to understand that we're handling data and not, sorry, handling facts and not data. So with that sort of little framework in mind, I think to myself, how can I now possibly um, 
analyse all of that and get some meaningful information out about a particular spot on the Earth's surface. How can facts be processed into knowledge along with the traditional data sources that we've had in the past? Well, this is where I think the um, expert system work comes in. And let me just start with this um, half a slide here, which I'll fill in in a moment. And again, for those of you who have heard me talk about this, you'll recognise this as a theme I've been talking about for quite some time. But in the multi-source GIS problem, I think we make lots of mistakes in how we analyse the data. And what we do, the biggest mistake we make, is we often try to apply the same image extraction technique to each particular data set. Yet each data set has its own optimal mean, means of analysis. And I've tried to represent that here on this slide. I've said, perhaps the first data type we're dealing with might be satellite spectral data. Well, there'll be some good processes that people will apply to analyse satellite spectral data. And um, depending on who you are, there'll be classification techniques of one form or another. The important thing is the output of that is a set of labels or a set of facts. If the second data set were radar, then there are different procedures you would use for analysing radar data to give you a set of facts about that particular spot on the Earth's surface. I wouldn't use the same techniques for radar that I would use for spectral data. It makes no sense. The interesting thing, though, is once you have carried out those analyses, the vocabulary after that second block on the left-hand side is the same. When you go to the, the very left-hand side, radar data and satellite data and spectral data are very different. Once you've analysed them, you're talking about labels like vegetation, soil, water, smooth surface, rough surface, things that are labels or perhaps facts. And then you can process that knowledge. And uh, that knowledge processing can take many forms, but here's where computer science comes in. And as an electrical engineer, it grieves me to say that this is going to be a computer science problem, but I think it is, folks. Computer scientists now need to come into this problem and help us understand how you process facts. Expert systems can do it, and we've got lots of examples of expert systems solving exactly that problem. But fundamentally, we need now to address the problem as one in processing knowledge in a way that artificial intelligence systems and computer science systems can do it. And here's where I think we can actually process the social knowledge as well. It's cultural data, social data, um, citizen-generated data is generally always in the form of facts rather than the numbers and data. And so I think that framework where we have a knowledge processor based on um, some form of artificial intelligence is a way to do it, is a way to approach the problem. And of course, not to forget the fact that whenever you do some analysis, no matter what that analysis is, you've created a new product you can put back into that data estate. The problem is, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how, how we seek meaningful convergence of facts in a, in a sort of a high quality, low error form in order to fit into that model. So I'd just like to finish up by putting up this question, in a sense, this multiple question. We need to understand social convergence. We need to understand why when 20 of you contribute something to Wikipedia, ultimately it converges to something that we all find acceptable. And, and that's a social science problem, of course, as much as a technical problem. And um, this is where I, my, our colleagues, in um, my colleagues back home, there are social scientists and computer scientists working together on the same problem, largely around things like the Arab Spring and London riots, about why those mysteries went viral and who's influential. But we need to take that to the next stage and understand how you can get convergence so that things like Wikipedia work and so that things like this work. And how do we check integrity? In Perth, we had some comments along the lines, well, perhaps there needs to be an expert sitting at the end as the quality control manager that says that fact's good or that fact's bad. But I think too much regulation there is bad. I think the social networks themselves will sort out the, the high value data from the low value data. And finally, some data will have value for a few seconds or a few minutes or a few hours or a few days. How do we build that into our overall analysis process? So colleagues, with that rather unsatisfactory ending, that's where I'm going to stop. But to me, um, there's an enormous challenge for the image processing community out there to help the digital earth community understand how to process this enormous 
enormous and, and varied and rapidly changing uh, state of information and data in front of us. Thank you.